Okay, so thanks for coming. Um, this is, um, Claire asked me to do this training pretty much because I think we often get emails from people who get confused. They heard maybe a data set might be an NCI and they don't know how to go about it to find it. Um, um, actually, should I say also in a way data discovery because um, most people worry about, you know, not being able to locate the data, but there is also um, it's also really, really important before you use a data set to actually locate as much as information possible on that data set, so just to make sure that you're using the right data. Um, it's also a time in which, um, at this time, NCI is introducing lots of changes with the data project, so it was a good timing to, to actually run uh, a little bit through what might be changing and why is actually changing so you don't just get frustrated and you know that there's a reason why some things might not work smoothly. Um, and finally, I wanna to touch, we're just gonna be able to just touch about how to use OpenDAP. So OpenDAP, if you never heard about it, is a protocol. Anything like FTP, FTP or other kind of internet protocol. And what that means is that it's a URL which has kind of special powers and that has been designed to make data more accessible. That's where the open comes from. And it's a URL you can use in lots of your analysis software and would allow you to open um, and subset very easily um, NetCDF data, pretty much. So we'll touch on that. And one of the reasons we'll touch on that is because sometimes it's in this context, is because sometimes it's really good to actually not download the data at all, even if it's not an NCI, but actually um, is a case which opened up is much more suited. Um, okay, so I'll just start on. So I didn't create slides. Can you see the, can someone nod or something? Can you see the screen I'm sharing? Yeah, this looks fun. Sorry? Looks good, Okay, thank you, Bob. Right, so what I'm showing here, actually, I didn't do slides, so you could actually find this, but also we'll be able to update it on our wiki. Um, so for sometimes still people, I meet people in the center who don't know that CMS is a wiki. This is where we collect all the documentation, so that's really important information, actually. And uh, recently, our wiki was offline because UNSW has changed the kind of wiki they use, and now um, they transfer all our content into the new wiki. So we are in the process of reorganizing it. The transfer wasn't really smooth, so please be patient. And actually, if you find some really weird stuff, we found some really curious links, which we don't know where they came from. Um, when we start looking into it, so just let us know. So this is how we organize it now. You can see at the top, you can find all our different services. And I also use this occasion to remind you, there's a link to the training, um, and YouTube is basically all the recording of this training will end up there. There's uh, our help desk, Slack, which is our chat channel. We're using our GitHub, where you can find some of our um, uh, code. The Conda packages, which is the Conda Scott and Aiden, especially um, maintained with lots of useful Python packages. There is the blog. We're trying to create a blog every week on uh, various um, topics, which you know are related to what we get asked to do and what we work with. Um, and funny, when you have at the bottom, you can see all the models and other resources. And the one we're focusing now is going to be the data. So I've been starting this data access page um, where we're going to go. And this is pretty much what we're going to look at. Um, so finding data sets and particular kind of data at NCI. Um, um, I had to do a kind of disclaimer. <laughs> Lots of the stuff I'm going to work, I'm actually sort of, and I didn't want to sound very negative, but I'm kind of actually focusing a little bit on the things that don't work. 
Um, and I'm focusing on that because I don't want people to be put off and I want you to understand why it might not work and to understand also that in the next few months, in the next year, definitely a lot of these will run a lot more smoothly. But um, I still think that you should follow up this order or attempts to find the data, which I'm going to talk about. So the first research you can use is the NCI data catalog. So there's a link here, but I'm already opening. Um, so the NCI data catalog is really um, a collection or description of the data sets. Um, as you can see, there's, or maybe you can't see, but there's uh, 696 data sets or services or maps listed in this catalog. Um, this is not all the data which is at NCI. Um, it's a relatively new service. So NCI started really organizing the data in the last two, maybe three years. And they choose to use this um, kind of catalog to list all what we call normally metadata, so the information on the data set, which is called GeoNetwork. This is not the most user-friendly um, kind of way to store this data. Uh, at least um, it's, it does cover all the standard. It's useful, I guess, from a data librarian point of view, but it's not always the easier to navigate the best. It doesn't always give you the best view. NCI is in the process to improve the, the full view that you're going to see. So I'm not going to go a lot in detail. Mostly what I want to point out is that you have a search field and also there was an attempt by NCI to divide the data sets in, by different topics. Now if I click on here, um, you might see there's 99 data set which are listing climatology, meteorology, atmospheric stuff. There's none on our data set, for example, in here. So this is still a little bit limited. It's one of the things you might be able to use in the future. At the moment, it doesn't provide very reliable result. And the reason is that um, all these data set that are listed, the records are created by people like me who manage the data on the disk. And so this, um, when NCI introduced this, there was a lot of uh, variance in what people will provide in terms of information. And what NCI is doing now, and I suppose it's done with these 99 data sets, is to go back and check the quality of each one of these records, so mostly all groups of data set, and working with the data manager to improve the way they are described and also maintain on disk. Um, so, as you can see, as well as topics, which with this extra layer that NCI has added, there's keywords which are provided by, um, by the data manager when you write your own data plan. Um, now, even here, there's a little bit of weird stuff, which is, if you're not familiar, you might not recognize. I know that 0401 actually is exactly the same as these. It's, it's the standard for field of research in atmospheric science. So um, lots of this thing needs to be improved to all of the in one category. Um, and uh, yeah, there are also other fields which are not tremendously useful and there are others that could be um, probably had it there. Um, one thing also I want you to know is that once you start searching, you're just going to be shown all, only the type of resources that have been defined in, by any one of these data sets. So if I actually go back onto the NCI catalog and I just do an empty research, that's a way to actually pick up all the possible um, fields you might be able to search. That's just something to keep in mind, mostly for the future. The other one is just a free text search. Um, so it's kind of does the sort of thing you might expect. So if I start in typing precipitation, um, I'm getting, oh, sorry, we should go again back here to see all the data sets. I'm starting getting some suggestions from the thing. Okay. Um, I don't know if you noticed that until I got to the end of the word precipitation, 
is now showing me all the data sets that had the word precipitation in the title because he's searching for them. So I can have a look at them. And now if I just click search, it's going to return me all of this one. I didn't really quite show you, but it would have been about 30, something like that. But now he's returning actually 62 results. And this is because as, as well as looking for the word precipitation in the title, he also looked for the word precipitation in the main answer. Okay, so that it's just a simple thing, but might help you to work out why sometimes you might not find stuff. So if I don't actually write the entire thing, and I go and do a search, this is the only data sets I get. And because that's precip major 0 0.2 millimeter into the um, um, title. So it just looks for the full word. You, you actually have to type everything, which can sometimes be confusing. I found the first time I was trying to look for all the MERA data, which could be just MERA or MERA2 or and the search wasn't working the way I expected. Okay, so that's for Genector. Let's just have a look at uh, uh, what a random um, record looks like. So as we said, there is a description, which potentially, hopefully it's a little bit more detailed than this. Um, it, it is if these files are available on the actual data portal from NCI, which is called, which is the NCI Fred server. We'll look how it is uh, in a short time. You're gonna have a link to that. Normally, if you work at NCI, you don't really need the kind of information you need if you work at NCI, which I wonder now if it's this one, interesting, not here, is in which project the data set is. So it should be here, and that's one of the downside. Um, okay, let's look for a different record. So this is one of the issues I was pointing out. It's not necessarily consistent. Um, my computer is overeating, doesn't help. So this is one of the record we publish. And for example, in this case, it tells you in this research identifier weight. Um, this actually means that this data is in the UF project. Okay. Now the view we are looking at, um, it's actually not wonderful. It's unfortunately is the default view and is one of the things that NTI is looking at improving. If you actually want to see most of the information, the best way is to go onto this little eye and look at the, um, and click here on the complete, basically, and look at the complete view. And then you can find all the information which actually has been provided for this data set, including the people who created it, the person who is um, managing it, and if there is a license, and various other things. Okay, is there any question um, about this? Oh, maybe there was something else I meant to show actually. Um, you can see here, for example, because this is part of our data set collection. Um, this is what a data set collection look like. So normally we do have in that case, what you might find is a record for the entire collection and then underneath that a record for each data set. Now, unfortunately, that's not true for all collections. Some groups just have maybe terabytes or data sets, which they all bunch together into one collection and all they provide it to NCI is the record for the collection. And um, it's a really becomes a little bit hard then to work out uh, what data sets are in that collection. Or I can show you some other record but then no description whatsoever. So there are some limits, but it's, it's still, um, I think a good idea to go through this first step. Um, and sorry, I'm just stopping sharing a second so I can see if anyone's got a question, quite clear. 
Um, so the reason why it's still a good idea to go through this is because if I'm going there and I found a data set and I can mention one which was SOC and I was in a room recently with 12 other data managers and we couldn't work out what SOC was, right? <laughs> Um, and that's all the description it was. Well, then maybe is better when you sit on the file system, you might just look at this data set is fine, all the files are there. When you look at that, that's the way it's managed, that should ring a alarm bell. Most probably no one will look at this data set for years, which was the case of this one, and I've been even offered to put enough information. It, you really should really think about it before trusting something like that. Um, so I'm not saying that, say, even the records are put out there, I'm perfect, sometimes I just don't have the time, but if you can't even find someone and contact someone who's responsible for that, steer away from it, because it just might not be um, in a usable state, right? So that's why I was distinguishing between just finding the data and actually discovering the data, which is finding out all the um, story about it. Okay, going back to the second step. All right, the second step is um, check our wiki. So even for all the data set we manage, we don't put all of them into your network and there is a, a there could be some reason for this. Um, the most common reason is that maybe we just got a tiny subset and I don't want to advertise that in a completely public space and getting a lot of people ask me if I can download more stuff, which maybe is not used to the center. So most often in this case, um, we'll add that to our UAA data project. And I won't describe what I've done in your network, but I, I would have a page for the data sets, like I can just show you one um, like this which because we just mm -hmm. might need some update um, where I describe uh, what we download if there is a license and acknowledgement and you know where to find it, what variable we download it and have various links to the original data and so it's all information which would be good if you can read that before just going straight on. Oh, my friend told me that I'm going to find the error interim on you before I got access to it and just jump onto it. It's important to know what error interim we are talking about, what we did with that, how we downloaded it, did we convert it, and so on. Okay, another reason why I would like people to read this is because it's really, really important to acknowledge the data you're using. Um, in a good way, properly. And one of the reasons is that like, I put a lot of time even just say, downloading and managing this and updating this regularly. If we don't know that people are using this data, then there's no point for us to put this much work, right? The same is for the people who originate the data even more, like they need to know. So even if I downloaded the data, but the data policy asks you to actually um, go on the on the website and um, you know just uh, create an account or whatever as if you're downloading this is what you should be doing so they actually get a real um, number of people real number of users and and they keep on providing this service for free which is what we want okay so um, you'll see even directly from the main page, you can see a list of data sets. So let's go back onto our main page. And you click here, we got the most common ones, which people ask all the time. And then we have another page, which will have all the data sets. We provide some information on, or that we manage ourselves. Okay. So, access. Cool. If you still can't find anything, um, just absolutely feel free to ask the help desk. Um, we might know, or if you're just confused by the information you find, which is, for example, we 
happens all the time with AWAP. I don't know if you're familiar with this data set. There's so many versions out there and it's kind of complicated to, to work out what you need to use. And, and even as we keep on getting um, to hear different stories about what's uh, the official, what's going to happen with this data set. So if you're in any whatever doubt, feel free to send an email to us. Obviously, we would like you to first check your network and our wiki. And when you're sure that you don't find what you need there, um, ask us. One of the reasons to ask us is that we are, um, um, potentially we can download the data set for you. Um, when we receive a request to download a data set after making sure that the data isn't really hidden somewhere else and raging and there is no alternative, um, we evaluate how difficult it is and how useful the data set is. So if we recognize that that's a data set that lots of people might want to use and it's not particularly complicated to download it, it doesn't require 100 terabytes of storage, we're more than happy to do that for you. We rather all the data sets, even the small ones, to be shared. Um, and the reason that even a small one is much better in a share place is because um, um, it makes it easier to run all the updates and guarantee there is a little bit of quality or if something goes wrong at the source, we do check uh, for changes and other stuff. So it's, even if you think, oh yeah, I can download this, it's just a few gigabytes, it's probably a good idea not to. Um, it's fairly rare that we had to say no to someone, but we can't. Normally when we think something is uh, too big, too much of an issue, um, I can mention an example was the SES and the CCSM4, they both big, uh, and symbols or model simulations, um, which are organized in a terrible way. You need to request, the data is all on tape, you need to put a request and then the, it's the slowest download you can ever imagine for very big files. So it's, it's, it's fairly painful even for an experienced person. Um, so in that case, for example, we did ask, we had to ask the infrastructure committee because we can't decide ourselves to spend a lot of time into something. And uh, what the infrastructure committee is probably still working on the final answer, I think. But um, what we agree with them is that we will download it, we start helping researcher we needed that data set and we end up downloading even if it's a small subset and then I did work with other people at CSIRO, at NCI, because there was an interest from other from our collaborators to, to see if NCI can actually provide the storage and some form of management of this data. So the solution might be simple or more complicated. What we will ask you to do in that case is to basically write, um, write us a few paragraphs of why you need the data and detail what you need so I can add to that an evaluation of the time and the storage needed and then share it with infrastructure committee and they'll get back to us. Okay. Um, good, finally, once you find which, oh, actually, I'll just get another break and any question? So good, excellent. Oh. Go on. Um, once you find the data, I just added this because it might not be obvious to anyone. Um, you, actually, I just had a question like that yesterday. Uh, you meant to request access to the project. So if you can locate the um, project code on GeoNetwork or if on, on our wiki, wherever, then you can actually go onto the my.nci.org, which is where you manage all your projects and your account. And uh, that's what it looks like. I've already added on. You've got all the projects you belong to. What you need to do is pretty much go in here, find the project or group, say that I need to join RR5. 
um, I just type that in and then I can click on that. And because I don't belong to that, I can just click on join. If there is some, um, this in this case just says this reference data, sometimes you might have a license or other condition that you need to agree with. So just automatically NCI, even if it's not been written, ask you to <coughs> agree with it. And then I can click this request membership and the responsible person will receive an email. And if you're lucky, they will just go back and say, yeah, that's okay. Um, and approve your membership. It will still take about half an hour after you've been approved for the system to pick up the changes or your groups and your permission, and then you'll be able to access the data. So it's that easy. Occasionally, data manager might come back and ask you why would you want to access the data set. They might want to know, are you using And again, they might need that information not to annoy you, but just to be um, able to justify providing this data set and making sure as well in some cases that the data gets used for the, um, in, in the proper way, which might seem a dumb thing to say, but we know someone, I received an uh, annoyed email from Japan because one of our students used some model input data, which is generated just as a model input to actually run some analysis which wouldn't have been very good scientifically, and then they kind of publish. So we're trying to avoid this kind of issue, right? Okay, finally, as you can see, I put here also some of the data, some links straight on to data that we maintain, we manage. Other data set that lots of people use, I do need to touch on CMAP, since that's one of the most common. Um, I won't go in detail, you can find the detail by clicking in there, but, um, CMAP now is managed and downloaded by NCI. We have help and we still help providing feedback and the you know, um, helping them setting up their services and making sure that things are running smoothly or as much as possible. And one thing that we did together and which Scott and I have been involved was to create um, this tool, which is called CLEF. We call CLEF as climate funder, um, which is based on Python, but also works as a common line, is, is available in our Conda packages and help you locating the CMAP data on raging. As well, you can actually put in requests for new CMAP uh, to be downloaded. So what it will do, will check what's available online compared to what's local and uh, give you a chance to um, create a request file that then can be sent to the AI. Um, I also listed here some of the one which, as I say, we get lots of questions about like HAYWAP. And uh, I put a link to the NCI Prex catalog, uh, which we gonna look at. You don't really need to, um, this is basically if you wanna access uh, some of the data, which is at NCI, um, like for example, all the data set that we publish, and then put on this um, server so they can be accessed by anyone um, remotely. So you can either download or subset the data. And we'll see an example because Threads, basically Thread server uses also the open up protocol I was talking about before. Um, if there's um, not questions from anyone about uh, funding data at NCI, um, right. Um, I was going to move on to the external data sources and then I remember um, that I was going to talk to you um, about what's actually changing. So, as I said, NCI basically started two or three years ago, and at the time they, bas they asked people who were sharing and data on the fault system to provide 
data management plan. So to say, okay, um, are you managing all these data sets? Is there a license or not? And detailing, so they could build the Geonector catalog. Right. After having done that, um, they do realize that there were um, a lot of the way the data was actually managed on the system was a little bit random and very dependent on people and not always done in the best way. So they are reviewing each data project. Okay, so there's going to be some updates. So one thing that they started introducing and that some of you might have already noticed, for example, we do have um, um, a dot we have a data project which is called UA8. That was the first time we could actually have some disk to post-process data and then as evolved as the place where we put the data sets that we're going to publish and some data set that we want to share and they don't have their own allocation, right? So they don't want any more projects like this, which have multiple um, use um, and one reason why they don't want that is that they want to make sure they want to know if you're asking access to UA8 because you want to use the C20C plus data set or you're trying to use JRA 52 or, you know, one of the many other data sets which we saw there. So what they're trying to do, they're trying to um, add one data set, one project code potentially for bigger data sets at least, or, or create uh, collections of data sets which are completely heterogeneous, which have some sense in it. So as to get an idea and they need to do, uh, or how many people are, you, are interested in a particular data set or in a particular collection, because they need to justify it and get some actual numbers to the funding bodies. Um, so one thing they did to avoid this is to remove the word readable access from projects like U8, for example, was one of these. So then everybody uh, all of a sudden had to go and, uh, and, and ask um, to join the project if they didn't already. Okay. This has been done, I think, for most of the project that we normally use. And in any case, NCI would have sent you an email if that was happening for a project um, you know, kind of in your field or something that anyway has been advertising this for a while. Um, there are still some projects around uh, which have an entire group can access that. So for example, there is the office reanalysis, uh, which is accessible to anyone in V35. Um, that gonna disappear as well. And we gonna send um, um, a notification to anyone in B35 before that happens. So you don't get caught all of a sudden. You can't run anymore your script or something. Okay, other changes that are happening. So we are moving data across and there were a lot of changes in, um, in the climate space actually on how things were organized because um, in particular relating to another project, which is RR7, which we're going to look at um, for the reanalysis, because some of the data sets were basically really not maintained anymore. And so we had to get together with all the people involved and take some decisions. So these are all proposed changes. I can't say this is exactly what's going to happen. And what I can promise is that I will try to keep the wiki updated. So both this page and the single data set page. Um, so in terms of U8, uh, so the C20C plus, for example, which is a pretty big data set, about 80 terabytes of data, um, will need to move from there. This is another kind of um, model ensembles like SESM and CCSM, and we are trying to get their own project code. They might be all together because they're very similar data used by the same groups. Uh, Cosima data, which has been published, will be assigned a new project pretty um, soon. Um, so if you were accessing the data set, it's not going to be anymore in UA8. Um, same thing for all the data we publish, even the data we publish, both the all the collection for the whole center and the new center uh, will both be assigned a new project code. It's going to be the same one at least. 
And we are considering maybe to create a um, new project code for all the precipitation data. So there's quite a little bit here and there's often the same data sets in RR7. So we tr any, any other projects, so we're trying to locate all of these and to add just one official replica and it, it is going to be still in the reanalysis project or most probably we're going to have a separate precipitation data. Um, JRA55 do for the one of you who run the MOM model, there's now an official version available in a different project, so eventually will be phased out. Don't panic, it won't happen until the MOM configuration will be updated to use that version. And even after that, we're still gonna give you some time to update everything. Uh, for other data sets, we're still trying to work out what's going to happen. They're not going to disappear for sure, but we just had to find the right project. RR7 is probably the one which is more dramatically changed. Um, we individuated a whole lots of data sets, which I hope you haven't been using. Um, they're mostly monthly data, which have been basically not maintained properly. In some cases, we found some some years have one grid and some years have a different grid. So we quarantine all of these. Well, we're going to quarantine all of these and potentially delay them unless there is a request to provide them, in which case we need to provide them in a different way. Um, in some cases, there are alternative sources already. So it doesn't matter. For others, we're going to use an, a new data set, Create IP, uh, which if you're going to do especially model evaluation of CMET data, I suggest you go and have a look. It's been created on purpose to compare CMEP data to reanalysis, and, and so it can be useful for you guys. And because most of this monthly data was using for this purpose, we've been trying to evaluate things like era entering, and I'm talking just the monthly, not the six hourly data. Um, and just to download that directly from there. So they are they're all going to be on, potentially on the same grid, but don't, uh, I wouldn't, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but in any case, provided in a very similar uh, structure, so that should make things easier. Another one which potentially I think people at UNSW has been requesting in the past is JRA55. Um, they also provide in a six hour version and we noticed that they have all the variable we're interested into. It would really cut a lot of work for us if we could just end these over to NCI, which would be the one managing it. So we'll be considering that. Um, other will still be available there like Meritu and as I said before, precipitation data might be joined with the other data in U8. Um, there's more changes we discussed, but with so many, I just didn't have time to put them in. This is also a good reason to, even if you know where the data is, to go and check the documentation in the next year because it's going to be a lot of changes. Okay, now going to external. Oh, sorry. Any question on that? Any worries? Okay, external data resources. So I'm mentioning this here because we can't always really copy everything on Regin and there might be cases in which, um, you know, we can't really provide the data or even simply, you know, um, there might be, there's always new data sets out there and, uh, you know, you might want to look for product which is suitable for you and you don't know what data set you actually want. So um, this IPSA stuff, obviously, you can just go out and Google. Um, I found these two websites are actually a good place to start. They the NCAR Climate Data Guide. I don't have enough time to uh, run and show it to you, but they have, and they reanalysis.org. They both have reviews of data sets, or quite a lot of data sets in the climate space. And it's really good because if there is an issue with a particular variable and you know, they maybe plotted a lot and did quality checks, so it, they 
really, really good to work out if that's something that you should use or not. It's suitable for the kind of analysis you're doing. There are obviously, of course, a lot of data for also for us. I listed some of the Australian ones. Research Data Australia is just kind of another metadata repository which in which all Australian research data sets might eventually be uh, um, listed into. So this can be good, especially if you need something which is a little bit out of your discipline and you've got no idea where to start from. There's obviously climate data services from the Bureau and tropical cyclone specific data services. TPAC has a climate and ocean data portal, which is threads, so you can access your data in open data as well. Um, AODN is another one for oceanographic data. Um, TERN will be put to rest your data. I haven't even had time to put that down. I'll, I'm going to try to update this um, and add more link eventually. There's obviously um, global data repositories. So NOAA and NASA have heaps of them. Um, just started listing some of them. I listed actually paleoclimatology to remind you that when you publish we has we actually if you work in the paleoclimate field um, we have established contact with them and we can use whatever you've done to publish we has to get your data sets all in this repository so I just wanted to chuck that in um, so there's other various things some include visualization tool some can be even a bit more sophisticated and allow you uh, to do a little bit of um, analysis remotely um, all these initiatives are a bit more recent you often can't do really complicated stuff but in some cases you might be able to create actually an account and get access to be more computing resources as well one of them is the Copernicus Climate Change Service. If you're not familiar, this is where, for example, lots of the European data is now is, including where we download ERA 5 and eventually, well, ERA entering, which is going to an end. Um, there are interdisciplinary data repository, which might have been of interest, like the Tropical Data Hub is also so from climate, but also maybe health data linked to tropical um, environment. Similarly, Aurin is an Australian initiative to put together all urban data for people who work um, at that kind of level, which I know some people do at UNSW. Um, finally, if you're really fond of Google, they have developed a new data set search toolbox. I'm just going to show you like very, very quickly, but if you're publishing, we ask, I'm just going to use MSA again. The data sets will also be listed in here. What we're trying to do basically is trying to list data sets which have been published in a um, trustworthy repository. And since we publish, we enter, but we also publish with the Research Data Australia show before, um, they are basically getting everything which is in uh, Research Data Australia. So it's that will make your data set potentially a lot more. Um, fine, accessing data we opened up, okay. Um, I can't go into detail, we just got 10 minutes. What I'm gonna say is that I did a blog two or three months ago to demonstrate a classic case which using opened up is the best thing to do. So I will just use that as a, um, base as i said before it's just another kind of protocol so uh, it's something that allows you you don't need to download the data um, you just use a url in most cases the same way you will use a file you can get a few more details from this blog um, what can i say um, most software has been opened up has been around for more than a decade, for sure. Um, it was used a lot more when storage seemed to be a problem, and then it seems like we all had so much storage, people would just download the data and they forgot about opened up. And now it is getting promoted again um, because it's not possible always to download everything. Okay, just to show you how it works, we're going to use the test server. So it 
basically works really well. I don't think NetCDF is the only thing you will find, but it works really well with NetCDF. Um, so you can see um, that's a kind of opened up form from a particular kind of server. And you can see that you get all your attributes listed here, and then you've got your variable listed with um, basically the size, the shape of the arrays. Okay, and then you can see here, up here, you're gonna have a get an ASCII or get a coverage JSON, let's be a free, let's be a four. So this is the web kind of interface. I'm just using this to just, um, I want to show you what's happening here with this URL, which is the one that you will put in MATLAB or Python or IDL or R or whatever else you're using. If I'm clicking on latitude, basically I'm selecting this uh, latitude. You can see the now, uh, or can you see actually? That, um, I have now a question mark and latitude, and then I have this um, basically from index zero to 88 every step. So if I want every 10 step, I can do this and this will automatically change. So this is good at the start to just get an idea of what happens. Say that I select longitude. This gives you an idea of the syntax you need to use to create um, URL, but you don't necessarily need to go through this. Okay, I'm just gonna put something crazy here and show you now if I go here and I do get ASCII, it's just gonna get exactly what I'm asking. So this is the great thing about um, opened up that it just allows you to subset and select the data. Hmm. Sorry, Let's go back to this. Okay, so you can follow up this and see how this work. Now, um, what I'm showing here was an example with Python using X-Array, but as I said, if you're using MATLAB, MATLAB recognize open up URL just as another native data kind. And you can do a very, um, it just works in pretty much in most software in the same way. Now, um, I'm showing this with X-Array because it's particularly good in a way. So what I'm doing here, I'm giving um, this was an example in which a researcher asked for some um, very high resolution SST data. And um, she just needed a small region. So I look at this data was actually available in opened up and uh, I found it and that's already a good reason to use it is so you don't need to download the entire thing. What you can do, you can open it with X-Array just by passing the URL. X-Array will allow you, say, to select. It will just read it as a normal file. So I'm not sure if all of you are um, familiar with this. So um, don't worry too much about the syntax if you're not. But the idea here is that I'm just saying this case, just getting one variable in the same way I will always do, I can see what's the characteristic of the variable. And as you can see here, for example, I'm directly getting the variable and selecting the latitude and longitude I want, which was the region she was interested in. Um, in other, with other software, for example, with MATLAB, you might have to work out before which are the indexes which correspond to this region. I think that's a great thing on X-Array that you can just define the region and the time as dates rather than indexes. And uh, you still haven't really uh, loaded the data until you actually use it, as it will be. So, as, and I think the same thing happens in MATLAB until you actually load the data, uh, you haven't downloaded anything, you haven't transferred anything. So, these allow you to check first what's in the file. Um, now, what if you actually had to access lots of files like that? So. One thing is to, that once you browse one file and you know how to do that, you potentially can work with this in some sort of loop and get all the other um, dates and things you need. Now, the reason why I say that this was a really, really good example is because this data set has 19 years. It's actually fairly small, but it's divided in several files for each day for 19 years. 
So even for me going this and downloading this and maintaining it, and it gets updated kind of every day, um, it'll become really very quickly, very painful, right? Um, instead, one thing that you often find um, um, when the data is provided through these servers is that someone must have thought that most people might want to use the data in exactly the same way she wanted to. So just having a time series for a region or even a point. And what they do, they aggregate the data. They don't actually concatenate the files, uh, but they just create a virtual file um, which will show you all these thousands of files as if they are just one with a very long time series. So I managed to find the URL of this aggregated file, and that's it. So that's all she need to do to actually access thousands of files. That's all she need to do. And then she still get a slice. And if you look at it now, this will go from 2002 to 2019. So this is a classic example in which even me downloading the file um, wouldn't have make it easier. In fact, wouldn't make it more difficult for her to use this data set. So open up it's quite, can be quite powerful when it works. I listed then here uh, a lot of servers which use that. So as I say, one of the can be aired up, IREX, spread service, don't get scared by the thing. What they normally look like, they look like this is the NCI one, for example. You just have folders, you can browse through. Um, and then you can open a file. And when you look here, this is gonna be your opened up URL. And if I click here, I see a similar um, form as the one I showed you before in that test server. And, and similarly as before, I can uh, select something and it will, this URL will be modified. Um, it also comes with other protocols. So just a simple HTTP, I can download the data and I'm actually, um, I won't have anything else, sorry. On NetCDF Sunset is uh, yet again another view of the data set which allow you to uh, select maybe these and select a particular region and certain time step and then download them as a um, NetCDF file. Okay, so I'm showing you the NCI threat server. Obviously you might not um, go and browse that one. Um, but as I say, there's a lot, a lot of uh, climate sort of data, which um, is made public through threat server. And as I say, NASA and as IPSO repository, for example, or NCAR and all of these, which will have really quite a lot of data. Um, one last thing. Um, or kind of forgot that there's also things like this a module in Python which would allow you to to browse directly in your script through this, which is called Siphon. We'll up as a stage a blog on that. But also there are things like Panoply, um, which I don't know if you guys have seen, um, which gonna allow you to do similar thing. Instead of loading a file, you load the entire catalog, and then you can browse through it directly and click on and visualize something before you even download it. And now I had to really stop. I pack quite a lot of stuff in here. Yeah? Um, there's any question? Um, okay, may I ask, was it useful? Was it stuff you don't know about? Um, Thanks. <laughs> uh, if you, so if you're interested in having, in looking at opened up more closely, because I often find people say to me, I got no idea what opened up is. Um, I'll be more than happy eventually to do a training on that, or just simply let me add more blog material and stuff. Yeah. Cool, thank you. <laughs> you thank can- you for all of your hard work. Uh, it's really good. Uh, thank you, Katya. <laughs>
Um, so yeah, we're just trying to build more stuff into the wiki, but yeah, we were thinking that little blog is just for a starting um, thing about opened up and we would like to provide more example, also maybe touching different software, although keep in mind they all work very similarly. Okay, if that's all, uh, next week Scott will do um, accessing really big data, I think using X-ray, is that correct, Scott? Yep, that's right. Right, so I'm sure that's going to be very popular. Okay, all right, thanks for coming and